If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30. And again, while you're turning over there, um, I am not going to be able to go to South America this summer uh, for changes at work, but keep praying for that. And if I have to, um, if I have to find more work, uh, the Lord's already always blessed that too. But I will not be able to make that trip anytime soon. Genesis 30, beginning in verse 22. Genesis 30, uh, beginning in verse 22, the Bible says, And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son, and said, God had taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph, and Jacob said unto Laban, That send me away, that I may go unto mine own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served thee, and let me go. For thou knowest my service, which I have done thee. And Laban said unto, said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for, the, for thy sake. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to be with your people this morning. We praise you for that. Lord, we praise you for those that are gathered here because we know of a surety they're not here by accident, but rather by divine appointment, and, they drew, and you drew them unto yourself. God, honor your word with your presence this morning. Uh, make things known unto us according to your mercy and your grace, we pray it. Amen. And now, uh, maybe some not-so-familiar verses of Scripture we'll be looking at uh, this morning, it will be pulling out what exactly transpired here between Rachel and the Lord God. And let me say, first of all, I think Rachel was an infidel. I do not believe she was a believer. I do not believe she was a saved woman because she retained her gods when everybody else had given them up. If you remember, as Laban began to pursue them and caught them along the way, she lied to her daddy and says, the way of a woman is upon me, and she wouldn't rise up and let her search the trunk. And the reason is she loved God, she loved her false gods more than she did her dad, and she loved her false gods more than she did her husband. And from everything I can read in the scriptures, the, the decision for Rachel was made on the flesh and not made in spiritual things. Yeah. And probably Leah was the preferred wife to start with. And, and, and so we see then that with this said, uh, Rachel has a very real spiritual issue in her life. And verse 25 again, and it came to pass when Rachel had, uh, I'm sorry, verse 22, and God remembered Rachel. Now, I want you to see that the Lord God Almighty being sovereign always, he causes things to happen in the lives of the lost just like he causes things to happen in the lives of the redeemed. Now, if you don't believe that, you know what? Uh, uh, lost people breathe the same wonderful, glorious air and that we do, and they're sustained by it just as we are. They receive food and nourishment just like we do, and they're sustained by it. And so God remembered, and it's not remembered like he forgot Rachel existed. He looked on her problem and had mercy on her. You ever seen lost people healed from disease? I have. But healing still comes from the Almighty. Why does he do that? He doeth what seemeth good unto himself. Uh, it, it's not for us to question why God does something. So he looks on this lost woman, Rachel, and re she, he remembers that he ha she has no children. And God remembered Rachel and hearkened to her. Now, I think that's a very unusual phrase because it didn't say hearken to her prayer. It just said that he listened to her. Mm. 
You know, uh, I fully believe that empty prayers are reality today. And empty prayers can come from the redeemed, and they can come from the lost. And, you know, I think it's a very unusual thing that God still knows about it. He, but being all knowing, He knows your wants and your needs, whether you're lost or whether you're saved. And, and, and so he looks on that and, and he remembers that Rachel has no children and he sees her asking for children yet and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. Now, let me also say this. Having children is a great and glorious gift of God. And you know why our Baptist churches are so small today? It's because we've about given that up. Amen. Read the statistics. 1.5 children now. When Dolly and I married, uh, uh, we had uh, we had three children in five years, and you'd have thought we were the Dubbards. I mean, people were like flipping out that we had three children in five years. And you know what? That 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 impacted us. We're like, well, maybe we shouldn't have as many children. And you know what? Don't teach your young people that. And don't teach them that it is a bad thing to have children. It's a glorious thing. The Bible yeah. says they're our heritage. They, they're what's going to carry on to the next generation. And, and we look at our church today, uh, you know, there are, not a lot, there are more empty pews in here this morning than there are full. Do you th Number one, we want to blame that on the sovereignty of God, don't we? Well, if they're you know, real, real solid, if God wanted more here, they'd be here. <laughs> well, you know, it really hadn't changed that much. The problem is, you know, back in, back before World War II, the average number of children for a family was six, and most had eight to 11. <laughs> and back then, you know, the buildings were packed out. And it wasn't because they had so much more fam more families going. It's that the families that were coming were huge. And that's where we need to get back to today. And so Rachel desired this of the Lord. She desired to be a woman. And I mean to be a mama. And he looked on her reproach and, and gave it to her. And she, uh, excuse me, and she conceived and bare a son... <laughs> And said, God had taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Now, I want you to see that she was very excited about the birth of Joseph. Joseph would later be the very leader of all the, uh, of all the tribe, and he would be sold into slavery. And God had predestined a lifeline for him. But I want you to see here the inability to satisfy mankind. She wanted a son, and she wanted a son, and she wanted a son, and as soon as she got a son, he said, she said, I'll get another one. You cannot satisfy this stinking, rotten flesh. That's right. It right. is an impossibility. Right. That wasn't a spiritual thing to say. She, she was still in that ungodly flesh of hers. Uh, if you don't believe that, what did Hannah say? That, that there's your flip side of a barren woman. Hannah says, "Lord, you just give me, you just give me a son, and I'll give unto him all the days of his life." And you know what? She did it, and, and she wasn't guaranteed another child. Now the Lord blessed her and gave her five more children beside. But you know what? She didn't know that then. She followed through, and instead of praising him that now the barren had a child, she said, "I'm gonna get me another one." That, that's the unsatisfiable nature of this flesh. And it has always been that way since the fall of man. And it will always be that way. So when we're doing something in the cause of Christ, be sure that it is not in the flesh. Because if it's in the flesh, listen, you're not going to be satisfied. You'll be like unto Rachel. And you'll have a, your, your flesh will be in control. Verse 25. And it came to pass that, Ra that when uh, Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said unto Laban, send me away. Now, I believe that uh, he was a saved man. Jacob knew the Lord. I believe he was saved on the trail going down there in his little dream that he had. 
But you know what? He lived in rebellion for years and years and years. He uh, married two pagan women. And he uh, apparently wasn't too upset that they were idolaters until much later. Not before they left when he wrestled with God, right? And, and, and so here we find him uh, and uh, she... He said, I'm ready to go home. That, that was really his first spiritual move. I'm ready to return to my people. I'm going to turn and go back to where I came from. Now, listen, when you have a spiritual thought like that, people are going to rise in opposition. Brother Jackson's been experiencing some of that. I'm sure, I'm sure his parents is asking, where is Paris? Right? I thought it was in France. Right? Well that, that that's always been that's always been the case when man's fallen the will of God. So Laban wasn't excited. And the reason Laban wasn't excited is because he was acting like lost people act. Uh, if they can interfere with spiritual things, that's what they're going to try to do. And, and, and so we find that as, as Laban is, is making this conversation, and Jacob says, I want to go home. I want to, I, I want to leave you. He says, give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go, for thou knowest my service that I have done thee. And, and, and in other words, I was a valuable employee. I've been fair with you. I have served the contract out. And Laban said unto him, now get this, this is a lost man, an idolater of every kind. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For well, I have learned by experience that the Lord had blessed me for thy sake. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, the world's going to ask you to tarry. Just stay still. Don't get excited. Don't, don't, don't go to the extreme. Just stay calm. Tear it. Now, there's two problems with that. Number one, it's not obedience to the Almighty. And number two, what's going to happen in those years? Uh, you, you know the story as well as I do. They, they stayed on six more years to get the cows. But you know, uh, a lot can happen in six years, can it not? Six years is a, is, is a lot of time wasted. Uh, six years ago, I could do a whole lot more than I can do now. Uh, six years, uh, children can be born. Six years, people can die. Six years is a long, long time when it comes to the to the the service of the Lord. And so we know, and I think foolishly so, um, the agreement was made. But notice what he says. Then Laban, a lost man, an idolater by nature, he says, I've learned by experience God's with you. You know, what a testimony uh, of, of Jacob. What a, what a wonderful thing to be said about an idolater is I can tell that God's with you. I've learned by experience. You know what the very best thing you can do? Whatever trade you're in, whatever you're doing, you learn it by experience. I was talking to Sister Brenda. She sold the hotel. Now somebody... Uh, um, Somebody else bought it. She said, I tried to show them a little bit about it. Apparently, they were a little resistive to what she had to say. And she said, I guess they'll have to learn it on their own. Yeah, they will. If they fall flat on their face, they've learned by experience. Now, uh, I used to be really good at starting IVs or drawing blood, either one. Now, my age is catching up with me a little bit. Not as good as I once was. But back in the day, when I was young, they called me one stick. I usually got it on the first step. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know how that happened? I didn't read it in a book. The first time I read How to Start an IV, I read it in a book. Now, how would you like me to start your IV and all I'd ever done is read about it? Right? You know how I had that reputation for a little while? By experience. Now, 
you know, Donna was always an OB nurse, and she went right here. This is what we call the AC. And uh, I was like, well, that's for sissies. But see, when you when you get old, your AC is not like this anymore. You can feel mine. And when you get old, they become fragile. And you have to look for these little bitty things on the hands and pray over them before you stick them. And uh, that's how you become skilled at it. So apparently, whatever this heathen man had seen in uh, Jacob was impressive. And you know, he learned by experience. David learned by experience. You know what? And he didn't brag about it. No one ever knew he had killed that bear and killed that lion until it was necessary to tell him. He wasn't a braggart. He learned by experience. And your Christian walk, your closeness of, unto the Lord is by experience. And, and when that occurs, you can share it with others that are around. You can show them how uh, and tell them how it's done. Now go back with me very quickly uh, to Genesis 14. And, and, and we'll get, uh, we'll get a, a little view of this. Genesis 14 and verse 16. Uh, again, very familiar verses of Scripture. Genesis 16, I mean, excuse me, Genesis 14 and verse 16. The Bible says this, And he brought all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot. Uh, go to verse 16. And, uh, sorry. That's not the verses I would want. I'm sorry, I want to go to Exodus 16. Exodus 16. Exodus 14 and verse 16. The Bible says this, But lift up thou, but lift up thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, I want you to, to think about that, and, and, and this command of God to Moses was to hold up his rod, which was a, a device used to herd cattle, and he says, hold it up, and I'm going to part the sea hither and thither. I, I'm going to cut you a trail. Now, I want you to see how difficult would it be for you to say, uh, the Lord God said, Jared, I'm going to part the Cumberland River hither and thither. All you have to do is go down there and, and hold your hand out across the river, and I'm going to split her both ways, and you and Heather and them young ones are walking across dry shot. Now, what's the difference? You gonna believe it, Jared? I tell you what, it'd be hard, wouldn't it? Now, a lot of people don't know this. When you get off the boat dock down behind the courthouse, and you're good as long as you're on the dock. And when you get into the end of the dock, if you step in the main channel, it goes down 40 feet. Now, I would be good to the end of the dock, wouldn't you? I'd be out there with my stick. And, yeah. But that 40 foot step is a lot to think about, ain't it? See, how did he get to the point he said, okay? How did he get to the point where he just said, and watched the water? He learned it by experience. Oh. Remember his first thing that he was told? He says, you go in there to Pharaoh and said, just tell him, let my people go. And he says, you take your rod and you throw her down and it's going to become a snake and then grab her back up again and it'll become a rod again. Now that didn't mean enough to say, wait a minute, uh, so I don't do snakes. But uh, Moses was obedient. But do you remember what happened? The Egyptians could do the exact same thing. The magicians threw theirs down and became rods. But there was a little glimmer of hope because what happened? Uh, Abraham, uh, excuse me, Moses' snake ate the other three. You remember that? And that gained confidence that again and again he spoke plague after plague and they were growing in magnitude, lies, 
boils and on till finally it was the death of the firstborn. That's where he gave his confidence. I think ten, ten and all. You know, you know how you're going to gain confidence in the person of the Lord by trusting Him. Amen. Ten separate times. So by the time they got out there and they saw the situation and, and there were mountains on both sides and Pharaoh and his bunch were coming in behind him and they were trapped according to man's eyes. He says, I'm going to make a way for you. We're going to part the sea and you're going to go across dry shot. And listen, it wasn't one of those little Ben Hur movies where they were in to the water ankle deep. No, no. They were kicking up sand and running across the bottom and looking across and seeing sharks and whales all hand held back by the mighty hand of God. See, that's that that's trust that's grown. That's trust that's uh, learned simply by experience. You 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 can't buy that. You can't simply read about it. You have to experience it mm -hmm. time and time and time again. And then when he, when the Lord God asks great things, you'll say, "Yeah, uh, I know you're able." I know you can do that, and I, and I will follow you and so do it. And so we find that he does this great miracle, and then he slams the, sh uh, the sea shut. Now, this will give you something to think about this week. If you don't believe in a particular redemption or a limited atonement, why didn't that bunch of Pharaoh get by? Boom. It wasn't for them. The opening didn't belong to them. It wasn't part of God's plan for their lives. The part of the God God's plan uh, uh, for their lives that they'd be drowned in the midst of the sea. And you know what? It happened. It happened just that way. It wasn't by accident. It was by the mighty hand of God. And he he drowned every one of them. And that is the very same God we serve today. Amen. Amen. You know, when I was a young preacher and I first got in, in, in Baptist churches, they would talk about those things as if they were stories. And I've even heard supposed men of God say that's how it used to be. Well, funny to me, Malachi 3 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Mm. He, see, he still has the same character, he still has the same power, he still same, has the same ability. Nothing's changed. If he wants to part the Cumberland River, that's under his good graces and definitely under his ability to do so. And so we see then, we, uh, we uh, see what God can do. We, we, we experience that simply by faith. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. About mid to late, mid to Two, two and a half years in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's picked out three that he's give a special measure of grace to. Matthew 17, we're going to begin our reading in the first verse. And um, I want you to notice, and it's not by accident, what happens in Matthew 16. Uh, Christ reveals himself to Peter, right? Now, the best we can understand, they've done been together for two years, and Peter thought he was a neat guy, but I don't believe Peter was saved. Because when he said, Who do ye say that I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, you know what? That's a saved person. That, that's a person saved by the move of God instead of the move of a magical prayer, right? That's a man. That, listen, that, that's, a, that, that's a salvation you can get on that deathbed and go out into eternity and be just fine with. That's a salvation that's true. Now, this is a little bit later. You know, another thing that don't mean, you know, nowhere in there whatsoever, all he asks is who do you say I am? This one, who do you say Christ is? That, that's a very, a very personal question, isn't it? Remember, uh, he'd already asked them, 
whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? You, you know, it, it's still the same way today. Men will not acknowledge Him as the God-man. Men does not acknowledge Him as the living Jehovah in the flesh. Men does not acknowledge Him as the second person in the Godhead, the mighty Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that doeth what seemeth good unto Himself. They do not acknowledge Him that way. But you know what? They can't deny that history says there was a man named Jesus. They like to. So if they have to, they'll answer that way. But we find here, after salvation, that, that, that the Lord Jesus does an unusual thing. Uh, Matthew 17, the first verse, the Bible says this, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, that tight inner circle, uh, individuals that trusted Jesus more than they trusted themselves. John laid his head over on the Lord's over on the Lord's breast and said, "Is it I?" So he, you know, you know what we do? Well, we, we'd have been like, in a, like Peter. Well, I will never do that. I don't know who you're talking about, but it ain't me. But see, he had so little confidence in the flesh. He said, you know what? It could be me. Yeah. I, I may be the very one he's talking about. And, and, and so those type of individuals, the Lord Jesus picked to be very close unto him. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment white as light. Now, listen, th this is an amazing event because he transfigured himself, he displayed himself, he, like he likened himself the, the very the very God of heaven, and he says, listen, I want you to see it. You don't get those experiences by just simply sitting on the pew. Yeah. You don't. You know, it's good to attend church, but you don't you don't get experiences like that, but except with closeness unto God. And and he, he manifests himself. Now, let me say this, I do not believe that Jehovah manifested himself because I believe if that happened, they all three would have died. And if you don't believe that, look at the life of Stephen. Once he said, he says, I've seen the Father. And you know what? He was out of there. And, and, and so we see they behold this miraculous, unbelievable event. Why? Because they were near unto God. They had lots of experience. About midway, midway, a little over midway, they had walked with the Lord Jesus Christ for a long time. They had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to quit. You know, uh, there's opportunities all along the way to quit, ain't it? Uh, I never imagined myself as a Baptist preacher. Didn't want it. it was, you know, it wasn't appealing to me. Uh, every Baptist preacher I met, if I ever met, was poor to go with turkey. Why would I want to drag my family through that? I was going to go to the university. I was going to go to Vanderbilt University and get my degree, master's degree in nursing, and become a nurse practitioner. I already think of many of the tests, but God had a different plan. Did He you not? Know? He said, "You're going to take care of old people, and you're going to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ." And you know what? That's the best, most wonderful thing. I've learned by experience that obedience is necessary. When it's difficult, you learn by experience. When it's hard, you learn what God can do. And, and, and so we find they go up and see they, this magnificent thing, and, and I won't go deep into that, but I want you to see they had to climb a mountain for that to happen. They had to climb up onto a mountain, and, and that takes effort and strife and, 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 and risk to get to the top of the mountain. They did that simply to see Christ manifested. Verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elisha, and talking with him, and answered Peter, and said unto, Je 
Uh, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, uh, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou will, let us make here uh, three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elisha. And he said, uh, and, he, and, and while he yet spake, behold, the bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, I'll give you two things. If you don't know what to say, keep your mouth shut. Right? That was a very foolish thing for Peter to say, wasn't it? And, uh, <laughs> but you know what? Then the voice of the Almighty, God the Father, Jehovah, came down and said, You pay attention to Christ. You listen to what He has to say. Man, this crazy thing, messianic Jew that's overtaken our whole country. Listen, that, that kind of shuts that up a little bit, don't it? You listen to Christ. You listen to what He has to say. You listen to what He's got to do. And, and, and so we see also that the only other time that you really find this is when He was baptized with John in the Jordan River. And, and so... Them boys went up there not knowing what was ahead of them. You know what? Nowhere in the Scripture uh, is, is say now, uh, y'all come up here with me and you're going to see me transfigured out of this flesh into a heavenly being and you're going to see, you're going to see Elisha and you're going to see Moses and then you're going to hear the voice of the Almighty. They had no idea what so ever. They just said, come. No, I think some, that takes some faith, don't it? That, 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 that takes some believing faith and, and it impacts your life. You know what? If you stepped out there on faith from time to time and you've accomplished that from time to time and you didn't receive anything, maybe you just did it to look good. Now go with Acts chapter 9. Now, I am not the type of preacher that avoids Acts. You have to understand it from a biblical context. But listen to Acts is some good, wonderful things. The apostolic age was an amazing time in the life of the church, was it not? It, it was unbelievable what God gave them the ability to do. Acts chapter 9 in verse 36. And there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha. Now, for y'all that is old as me, I'll give you some more food for thought. Um, anybody remember the the uh, the television series Bewitched? Well, the daughter of the main witch was Tabitha, and the mother was Endora, which was by by the chance by chance where the witch at Endor lived. And that was in the life of, uh, of uh, uh, the king, Saul, King Saul. But anyway, te television does nothing by accident. You take that home with you. Because it, it, it is used to program us as a people. And it needs to be avoided if we can. And, and, and so we see that this, this woman, um, uh, her name is Tabitha which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if when, when you're out here, they can say, man, she was just full of good works. And we'll, we'll read a little bit about what she did. But listen, this wasn't attending church. This was making quilts for people who didn't have one. Uh, you know, and, and, and I think we have to be very realistic with the Lord's money. And I will say this, it never says she used the church's money to do this. I, I believe she used her own things and her own energy and her own resources to do these works, to accomplish what she did for the cause of Christ. And, and, and it was known of her what she did. It was known of her what her testimony was. Verse 37, And it came to pass in those days 
meaning in the apostolic days, and this was about a year and a half into the apostolic ministry. And it came to pass in those days that she, meaning Dorcas, or Tabitha, was sick and died. Now, this, that don't mean she died a little bit. That means she was dead. That means she was way dead. That means no coming back, nothing to be done. Tabitha, Dorcas, she was dead. And, and she had no signs of life. She no longer lived. She, she no longer had any, anything about her. And it was uh, very upsetting to the church there. Um, whom, meaning Dorcas, when they had washed and laid her in an upper chamber, and for as much light, and as for as much as Lida was not a Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there and sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come. And Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber and all the widows stood by him uh, stood by him weeping and shewing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made which she while she was with them what a wonderful testimony now I want you to see who she helped out now a widow today is not like a widow back then a widow today can draw off their husband and and they can have a number of opportunities and if their children are right with the Lord, their children will see what, that she has what she needs. And, um, but not necessarily so then. So this woman, uh, Dorcas, Tabitha, saw their, saw their situation and she goes, well, I'm at least making a dress to wear. I, I can get them a coat so that they could be a little more comfortable. And she did it. You know what? I, I dare say this. And remember, y'all, this is in the church age. It, it is not in the day of the Jew. Very early church day. So you know what that says to me? This is something we ought to be doing. Now, y'all know, those of you who know me, I'm not into a socialistic gospel by any means. But there are things we can do to help them. You know what? This is what I've always said because I've been there. I don't know what to come with. If I've got anything and I'm down to the last can of, uh, it's not going to fix me some, or Sarah fix me some turnip greens. If I'm down to my last turnip green, I'll divide it with you if you like. Now, if you ain't going to eat them, I won't divide it with you. Uh, but that's how we ought to be, is it not? <laughs> That's how we ought to be. We ought to have a, a gentleness and, and, and a compassion about us that marks even to the ministry of Christ. And apparently Dorcas had this, and the people were very grieved because of what they did. Uh, but notice this, but Peter put them all forth. So he was there by himself with the body of Dorcas. You know what that says? That somehow along the way, Peter had learned humbleness. Because I believe before, before this, maybe even when he went out and wept bitterly, Peter was a pretty prideful guy. He always wanted to be on top, didn't he? I bet, I bet he, after he got started pastoring the church in Jerusalem, he had done being on top. <laughs> but I want you to see here, you imagine raising the dead? He says, I'm going to try to go out for a minute. He knew what he was going to do. He knew what he was going to put before the Lord. And instead of being prideful about it, he says, give me a few minutes along with her. You know what? That's an amazing... How did Peter learn that? Are you three boys ready to pray over the dead? I don't know that we are, do you? And you know why we like that kind of faith? It is sad that Laban had better experience than we do. That he knew about the character of God more than we do. And he learned it by experience. He, you know what? I hadn't had that experience yet with my girls, but if somebody comes up that hill looking at one of my daughters, I'm going to keep both eyes on them. Right? 
And I believe later it was that kind of daddy. And he kept his eyes fixed on, on, jo, on Jacob the whole time. And instead of seeing problems, he began to say, you know what? God's with us, man. And God proved himself yet further. He, he, he made that crazy contract for six more years. <laughs> and whatever kind of cow, <laughs> Moses, I mean, Jacob said to be born, that was the color that was born. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. He's a man, he, he was marked by experience, time and time and time again. And, and God is able, uh, he, He's able to accomplish that anytime, anywhere, still today. And so he, 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 he still does that in our, in our eyes. But Peter put forth them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turned and turning him to the body said Tabitha arise and she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter she sat up and he gave her his hand and lifted her up and when he called and, and when he called the saints and the widows presented her alive and it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord and it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. Now, has our God changed? Absolutely not. You know, uh, if it be the will of the Almighty, he can still raise the dead. And uh, I mean graveyard dead. I mean Lazarus come forth dead. I've seen I've seen some pretty amazing things as a nurse. And it's it's taught me two things. <laughs> Number one, life comes from God. And when your life is over, it's over. And it don't mean it don't matter if you have a team of Vanderbilt physicians sitting around your your corpse. You know what? You're gonna die. And if God don't want you to die, you live in spite of everything. I took care of a man I know for five years. Me and Betsy took care of him together. Lived down over the edge of Dixon County. He had 8%, only 8% of his heart function. And we took care of him five years. You know why he didn't die? It was under the hand of the Almighty. I've learned by experience. He's the giver of life. And, and listen, lost people, he's the taker of life. You better, you better know the Lord Jesus Christ. You better, you better understand that you stand in his presence. You know, I love church. But I'd rather spend one moment alone with the person of God than an hour in church if he doesn't show up. And you? Mm -hmm. I've learned by experience. What have you learned by experience? A lot of you puzzle, well, I ain't nearly old as you are. You know what? You don't have you help you don't have to be old to experience the person of Christ. You don't have to be old to see miracles. You don't have to be old to see money come from nowhere. You don't have to be old to see food brought in where there was none. I don't see what he's saying. Now I'll say this, it starts as simply as this. And save it and you'll never die in sin. And see, once he saves you, he brings you to newness of life, you'll put faith in him. And if you really believe and trust him, that faith will 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 explode over time. And he does it by experience. What about you? 